What I found in the research is that when we are willing to stop and listen to stories of other people without judgment, without qualification, without trying to respond, and we just accept people's stories, you know, at face value, it actually begins to show us a layer that we could not see before. Hi, my name is Anita Novak, and I'm the author of this book. Welcome to season 12 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Thanks for watching, enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I am joined by Dr. Maria Keckler, who is the Director of International Affairs, Strategy, and Communications at San Diego State University. Her research explores the intersection of story, neuroscience, psychology, and education to improve empathy, leadership, human connection, as well as our collective ability to tackle complex challenges. She is the author of Bridge Builders, How Superb Communicators Get What They Want in Business and in Life. In it, she shares empathy-driven insights and strategies to help individuals master the art of leadership and personal breakthrough in business and in life. She is also the founder of Keckler & Company, a consulting and research agency that helps executive leaders and their teams drive empathy-driven cultures, foster creativity and innovation, and develop happier employees. Welcome to the show, Maria. Thank you, Anita. I am so thrilled to be here, and I am so proud to be holding your beautiful and amazing book, which I am enjoying so much. Uh, thank you so much for birthing it into the world. One of the things that I was really uh, excited to have this conversation about is that, you know, I, I always ask um, my guests to suggest a couple of questions and to sort of share what they hope their their the takeaway of our conversation will be. And I was really, really taken by yours. Um, so I'm just going to read it. And that is that empathy is hard. It unfolds gradually as we make an effort to be curious, ask questions and see the world through another person's perspective. So could you tell us more about why you've come to believe that empathy is hard and that it needs to unfold? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and of course, we, I often say, you do not know what you don't know, right? You know, I don't know what I don't know. And I um, was invited by uh, some colleagues at San Diego State to be part of a grant writing proposal for Alliance Healthcare. This happened, um, you know, maybe two years ago. And uh, the whole project began to open my eyes about the number of inequities in healthcare that take place and that disproportionately affect uh, certain populations you know, uh, whether they are low income, uh, certain background linguistically or, or diversity. And I, to be honest with you, I almost felt like, where have I been? Have I been under a rock? Because my world had been really outside of really looking at the world through inequities. And I'll tell you why. Um, I grew up thinking, you know, if you just do the very best you can, you know, you can do whatever you want. I was born in Mexico. I came as an immigrant to the United States when I was 16. And my dad, before he died, he ingrained in me and my siblings that our job was to be the very best you can. And if somebody is uh, mistreating you or somebody is not giving you the right opportunities, uh, just take that as data. And what can you do to improve yourself? So for me, it was, how can I improve my English? How can I reduce my, my accent? How can I improve my leadership and my acumen in, in different areas? And so I think I, I grew up with this idea that we have agency and we have the power to achieve anything. And so that's how I approach the world, very um, as an optimist, right? And I think we do need optimism, but at the same time, uh, when I began to read all, th all this uh, amazing research that look very objectively at how certain populations of people don't get the opportunities that many in enjoy, 
it just really stopped me. And specifically, it took me back to an experience I had um, a few years earlier where I had been suffering with a lot of pain for, for months. And I kept on going to the emergency room and they, comp- they kept on saying, no, it's indigestion, go home. Uh, here, take more uh, just anti-acid medication. Maybe if you lose a few pounds, it will help. And so I kept on getting sent back. And I was about to start my job at San Diego State, actually. And I remember just uh, going to lunch with a couple of friends and they looked at me across the table and they said, you don't look too good. Is everything okay? I said, well, actually, I'm in excruciating pain. I have a lot of you know, tolerance for pain, but yeah, I'm in a lot of pain. And I began to describe my symptoms and they looked at each other immediately and they said, I bet you anything, this is a gallbladder problem. This happened to me, one of the gals said, this happened to me and the same thing thing happened. I kept on getting no answers, no tests, you know, nobody believed me that it was something serious. So I ended up going, crossing the border to Mexico because a friend told me that the same thing had happened to her. She says, you need to go to Mexico. You need to go to Tijuana and just get a test. So she did that. The doctor confirmed it was a gallbladder problem. And she said, it was until I came back to the United States, even though I had insurance with that paper that the doctor actually believed me and he ordered tests and good enough, I had to have surgery. And so I was so taken back by the fact that optimism had been really good to me in the sense that I was ready for opportunities, ready to improve myself, but where um, it had not been maybe as good is that it was also a blind spot that prevented me from looking at how oftentimes we treat each other and how we need to advocate for one another and that we do live in a world that is unfair and that has problems and those problems are complex and we um, need to become more aware that we all bring uh, a certain level of ignorance to the table and we need to understand that if we're going to bring empathy to one another, we first to have to acknowledge that there's a problem. Mm-hmm. So that was my awakening for me. And that just changed my life. And, and it has never been the same, I would say. Well, well, I'm glad that you had those friends to share that with and that uh, the yeah. doctor then took you seriously. Um I think in your research, um, you use two powerful frames, right? One of them is empathy unfolding. And another one is the bridge building, which is, um, you know, embedded in the name of your book. Um, What do these two concepts mean to you? And are there some best practices that you can recommend? Yeah, you know, um, for almost 20 years now, I have been doing um, corporate consulting And I have used the framework of bridge building uh, to really help us understand one another, uh, bridge, uh, build bridges to one's minds and hearts, right? And so the idea there was always, what if you were to show up to a conversation with the intention to build a bridge to somebody rather than to be right? rather than get your point across, right? And so the idea is, you know, how do we think like a bridge builder? How do we listen like a bridge builder? How do we behave Mm -hmm. as a bridge builder? And so that has been a core of my work for, like I said, you know, many, many years. But fast forward really to um, the last um, three years where I really decided to come back to school in my third act to get a PhD so that I could contribute to the literature so that I could um, address some of the gaps with my own research that I read about. And the more I read, and to be honest, I wished your book had been out when I was doing my literature review because you've done such a marvelous job here. Um, But what I have found is that empathy is hard, right? You know, we all want 
you know, uh, coming from that optimistic mindset is like, okay, let's be empathetic. Let's be kind. We can do it. Um, I love the approach of being purposeful about it, right? I mean, we can, but I think um, what we don't realize is that there are many things playing in the background that oftentimes prevent us from even being purposeful about it. And you talk a lot about, you know, uh, the things that we can do. Um, what I found in the research is that when we are willing to stop and listen to stories of other people without judgment, without qualification, without trying to respond, and we just accept people's stories, you know, at face value, it actually begins to show us a layer that we could not see before. Um, I saw it in, in my own uh, experiment that I involved students in nursing, in a nursing program. And we know that in nursing is imperative that we graduate nurses that are able to treat uh, all patients with kindness, right? And, and to be fair, you know, nurses are heroes and they show up to be uh, to be there for patients to help patients right and so they so then that begs the question why do we see you know so much lack of empathy which is documented in the research we know that empathy declines the longer a student is in the nursing program empathy declines the longer someone is in the profession so that's the question if that's our intention if that is our purpose to go into a profession such as nursing then why do we see so many stories? And part of that is burnout, part of, you know, and you talk about self-care, right? You know, that being uh, empathetic towards yourself is imperative. Uh, so, so that would be, I think you and I share that as a strategy that if we are going to, we, we can only give what we have, right? If I am not kind to myself, I am not gonna be able to kind, be to, kind to others. But oftentimes we don't know, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to be kind. Listening obviously is, is critical. And as I saw students listening to the story of a patient and immediately have aha moments and then come back during the reflective activity to say, I have seen this happen so many times, but I never thought that this would happen to me. And so they began to say, when I'm a nurse, I need to remember this. I need to remember these stories and I need to be intentional, purposeful to be an advocate for my patients. And, uh, and so I think that listening without judgment, really assuming um, that we are, don't have the, the intuition to always act in the kindest way because of the stress that we're under, maybe our implicit biases, our in-group kind of preferential treatment that we give to people that look like us, like that sound like, like us, being aware of that is super important. So you talk a lot about storytelling and you've mentioned it just, mm -hmm. what role does storytelling play in this capacity for us to empathize and how can we become better communicators mm -hmm. through stories? Yeah. So I was very, story obviously has been at the core of my work and, and all of our work, right? Because we know that great communication, you know, cannot happen without great storytelling. But what is so exciting is that there's a lot of neuroscience now that shows that when we tell effective storytelling, we actually become more empathetic, you know, when we share and when we listen, right? So I was very fortunate to be, um, to be mentored by Professor Paul Sack, who is a you know leading scientist um, in the area of story and immersion and oxytocin, and so what is really exciting is that his work has shown that when we are exposed to effective storytelling, we you know bra our brain actually releases oxytocin which is responsible for connection, for empathetic behavior, for uh, closeness. And 
oftentimes we forget that we do need to trigger that in other people. So the more that we're willing to share stories, communicate in a way that connects to the heart and minds of those who we are trying to reach is going to be critical. And um, I think that more than ever, we are seeing the validity of storytelling, not only in the, in the business sector, in maybe the arts, but also in business and education. We are seeing obviously the popularity of TED, um, you know, presentations. I mean, we're moved by those stories, but I bet you anything, you're in a, in a conference, you're in a classroom and you're falling asleep or you're maybe starting to scroll through your phone. And the minute somebody says, let me tell you a story, what do we do? Our eyes look up, right? Uh, and so that's the power of story. And what we're trying to do in this research is really rather than saying, let me give you some empathy training, which I don't, I mean, I, I know that there is great empathy training out there uh, and I am not disvalidating it, but here's the deal. I think that empathy is a muscle and you don't go to the gym one and says, you know, I'm going to go for 30 days. I'm going to get myself where I'm, okay, I'm good. You know, and then you leave. I mean, that muscle is going to deteriorate. And so empathy is one of those things that we have to exercise, that we have to constantly, um, you know, forced to, you know, to be exercised and stories being exposed. That is my hypothesis. And that's what we're doing. We're doing, we're trying to uh, do these story, micro story interventions uh, in nursing programs and also in industry so that within just five, hearing a story for five minutes and then reflecting on that through a protocol that forces you to reflect and have self-awareness, you can actually use that to exercise the empathy that you need every single day. I love and I think that. that we can do that. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Are you familiar with narrative medicine out of Columbia? You know, I am not, and I am going to make a note of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I write about it in the chapter called Empathy Superheroes, where I do a deep dive on people in the healthcare profession who I think, as you mentioned earlier, yes. are, are superheroes. And there's um, there, Columbia, this one professor, I can't remember her name right now, but I'll put it in the um, um, details of this, uh, of our conversation. She believes that by asking questions about the lives of the patients, not just sort of like the physical ailments that they might have. Yeah. But to go ask from a holistic perspective what's going on in their lives, you can cull yeah. more information to yeah. get to the heart of an issue rather than just the, the symptoms. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we do have to, and again, you know, I wish I had read the entire book before today, you know, so I'm looking forward because I know that that is your last chapter. So thank you. But I do have to say, you know, we have to acknowledge that this, you know, obviously this is a much bigger problem that only I can solve, that you can solve. That's why we have to join hands. Um, we have to acknowledge that the systemic issues that really discourage empathy. And, um, you know, one of, uh, you know, a, a, a mentor, distant mentor, someone that I admire is Annette Simmons. And she is the author of the story factor and a number of other books. But um, one of the things that she always reminds me and others is that we have to simultaneously work on addressing how the systems don't help us be empathetic. So if you think of healthcare, for example, I mean, empathy, you know, looks like inefficiency because you have to, to ask, you know, when you were asking, not just ask about the symptoms, but ask about the story, they don't have time for that. They're not given the time. And when you have a system that is overly taxed, you know, especially COVID and other, you know, barriers, you know, the shortage of nurses, the, the shortage of medical professionals that are actually leaving the profession because they are overwhelmed and, and stressed, um, that is a problem. And so that's, you know, uh, in my research, I, I frame the work that we're doing under an umbrella of complexity theory. In other words, we have to acknowledge that this is a complex problem, not just 
a one quick solution, right? And um, uh, Weber and Riddle, uh, there were scholars, um, you know, city planners back in the 70s, <clears throat> and they coined the term wicked problem. And I think it's becoming more popularized because the problems that we face today, including healthcare and, and, and the shortage of empathy, it, they are wicked problems. So what does that mean? That means that we have to have, you know, what we know as interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary conversations. That means that we have to have people from different sectors, from different disciplines, from different communities, from different diverse backgrounds at the table so that we can share how we see the problem. Because otherwise we are very good at coming up with one solution, right? I mean, I came up with a solution. Let's think like a rich builder, but that is just a one slice of the problem, right? If, if you have a, an organization, if you have upper leadership that literally mm, uh, punishes that level of engagement inadvertently or purposefully, then we have a problem, right? And I think for nurses, I also show up to that conversation with great empathy for the plight of our nurses. Because yes, we can have strategies of how they can see the whole patient, how they can listen to stories. And I think that that helps. But at the same time, we cannot put all of the pressure on them to change a system that requires collective effort. Mm. That's fantastic. Hey, I don't mean to interrupt a great conversation. I just want to draw attention to the fact that there are over 120 equally awesome conversations of my podcast and YouTube series on my channel. Please subscribe. The world needs more empathy and you have a role to play. I'd love to hear your thoughts about some of the common misconceptions that people have about empathy mm -hmm. and the work that you do to dispel those misconceptions mm -hmm. through your research or some of your outreach work. Yeah, you know, and I think uh, the, two, the two biggest ones, I think, is, you know, I've mentioned briefly, but, you know, to just highlight them is number one, that we can just insert empathy training into a curriculum or, you know, into a workplace. Um, it's kind of like DEI or sexual harassment training, right? We can't just do that and expect that things are going to change. And so I, I see that we have to look beyond the quick fixes. Mm -hmm. And so that is the number one. The other, the, I think the other one is that we um, have a single solution. We have to look at it, you know, again, like a, a complexity issue. And so one of the things that we are hoping to do in the near future is a hackathon where we invite not only, um, you know, Gen Z you know, young professionals, millennials, but also different sectors to come and talk about the complex problem of empathy, declining empathy in healthcare, right? Uh, so staying in a silo and, and thinking that you're going to come up with a great solution, I think that's a misconception. Yeah. And then the other thing I, I would say is that, you know, underestimating how hard empathy is, um, you know, we all, you know, we all have been uh, maybe misunderstood, hurt, and, and how hard is it to be empathetic to, to those people, or even to anyone that reminds us of those people, right? And so we have to also acknowledge that it's going to be uh, something is not automatic, that we have to be intentional, purposeful, thank you for the, for the reminder of that. But once again, um, having conversations like this one are going to be necessary and ongoing. And we are gonna need a lot of people that want to say, I wanna be part of that conversation and I wanna contribute. Uh, one of the reasons I went into research after many years being in my career is that I saw gaps that I was not seeing anyone talk about. And I wanted to contribute to the work. And so I think that we don't all have to get a PhD to do that, but we can say, I can see 
this slice of the work where I can contribute. This is where I can make a difference in the community. This is how I can model that in my own home. This is how I can model this in my church and my, in my, the kids school. And, and so in that sense, we all can do a little something yet not grow discouraged because it's not solving the entire problem. Sure. You know, we do have to tackle both at the same time. Beautiful. I have two questions for you still, Maria, if you'll indulge. Yeah, One is, sure. as somebody who's been studying empathy for as long as you have, I wonder if you could share how it's had an impact on your own life and in your own personal relationships. Like how have you, Maria, yeah. as a person mm-hmm. changed as a result of the research? You know, I love that question because uh, when I was writing my book, um, the rich builders. And, and I just noticed that it is going to be almost eight years ago um, that, that I published that book. And there's a, a chapter on empathy. And I remember writing that, and I was having a block, like I could not write about it. I was thinking, and, and, and I finally realized I was feeling like an imposter writing that chapter. And the reason was, is because I have considered myself an emp- empathetic person. But there was one person that I felt and I had a conviction that I had not been empathetic with. And that was my mom and my mom and I, you know, who I love. And now we have an amazing relationship because of that moment. Um, I could not write without dealing with what I knew was a lack of empathy on my part to my mom. Um, we had a difficult relationship. We have a lot of baggage. We had a lot of trauma in our life. And so a lot of that trauma I felt would come out in unhealthy ways. And so I just got to the point that I just like, you know, I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to talk to her about this. And so I kept every time that we would have these difficult conversations, uh, I would shut down the conversation, shut down the conversation. I said, you know, I got to go. Or I would avoid when I would feel that she wanted to talk about certain things in, in our past. And I had to make a decision. I had to say, you know, am I going to write about this chapter and not deal with that? Or am I going to pause this and deal with it? So obviously I I chose the the latter. And I went and I had, I devoted a day and I knew it was going to be hard, but I told my mom, I said, mom, I want to apologize because I know that over the years, you've kept on bringing these things up. And, and I just didn't want to talk about him. And I've caught you off. And I and so I just want to let you know, I want, I want to give you the space to just share. I know that you've done it before, but I want to hear it all, right? And uh, and I just want to, I just want to acknowledge that. And so when we were talking, she shared some things that had happened to her that I had no idea that had happened to her. You know, one of that was that my grandfather had committed suicide and it was a very, very um, hard thing for her because she was only 12 and the way that it happened, it was incredibly traumatic. And I just remember thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I had no idea how much pain she had been bearing and how she had connected a lot of different events to that. And um Anyway, all that to say, you know, to cut us short, I mean, I think we, I just let her speak. I didn't interrupt her. I didn't justify it when some of it seemed to really feel like an attack on me. I just, I go, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. And, and then I kept on asking what else, following my own advice. I'm like, (laughs) what else, what else, what else? And, uh, and she got to the end and she says, I think that's it. That's it. And then at the end, she said, thank you. You know, is there anything you want to say to me? Right. I have to tell you that that was the last time she ever brought up those painful things. And when I was doing research, I read that when someone keeps on bringing up something over and over and over again, it's because they haven't felt heard. And that was absolutely true for me. So in that moment, when I extended that that empathy, you know, as a gift and as a part of our healing, it transformed my life. It has changed the way that I operate. I am not perfect by any means, but I do have to say that when I see uh, individuals who are not able to enter into that uncomfortable space, 
where we talk about difficult things, where we address, you know, interpretations, misconceptions, uh, ideologies. Uh, we are choosing really to protect ourselves. And that's what I did for many, many years. I was really just acting out of self-preservation, out of self-protection. But what I thought was self-preservation and self-protection was actually not doing that. It was just keeping me uh, small. It was keeping me uh, incomplete. And I am so grateful that we had that, that experience. And I hope that I can continue to extend that to others and, um, and contribute, making um, a contribution to the work that is so important. I'm so touched by that story. Your mom is still with us? Yes, she is. And she is my biggest fan, uh, cheerleader. Uh, we have an amazing relationship. And she, all through my PhD, literally, she would send me little emojis and she says, I'm praying for you. And I mean, just... Uh, it's a testament of what can happen when we step into the most uncomfortable spaces uh, that I am just so thrilled that I had the courage, number one, to, to step into that space. I'm really moved by that. I'm very happy for you, Maria. Thank um, you. I think so much of so many of us walk around with heavy cloaks and armor you know, without having necessarily the courage to have the vulnerability to go with curiosity to somebody and say, tell me everything I need to hear. Um, So maybe, maybe somebody listening or watching will be nudged by our conversation. I wish for that to happen. Um, I have a final question that I like to ask my guests. Uh, I ask it of all my guests, and that is to share a time in their life, if you can think of one, Uh, when you were on the receiving end of empathy and what that meant for you? Mm. Yes, no, that is, I mean, I can think of so, so many um, instances, but I I do have to say that my husband uh, of 35 years this year has been an incredible example of empathy for me. Uh, we got married, you know, 35 years ago, I was only 21. And I, um, I mean, I brought a lot of baggage, you know, the story of my mom gives you a little indication that, you know, there was a lot of brokenness and a lot of baggage and, and he brought his own as well. And I spent, I would say the first five years of our marriage, always wanting to uh, prove that he was going to leave because I had a history in, in all of my like generations of men that leave their wives. And um, I had, I didn't know that I had this deep seated fear that I was going to be the next one. And so as a form of preservation, I, would be the one that I would prove that that was right. And I, um, I would just do some crazy stuff to be honest with you, because I just wanted to see if, you know, I mean, call it a test or whatever it may be. And he could have just said, you know what, I am done. And it actually would have been my fault because I was being such a crazy person, um, in a lot of pain, but I, have to tell you that time and time again, he would always be the one that would apologize. And he would be the one that always um, reminded me that no matter what I did, and no matter what happened, he was not a quitter, and that he was in for the long haul. And he would do it with conviction. He would do it with love. And um, and it just, to me, was the biggest gift I could have had at that point in my life because I was a broken girl that just needed to know that I was loved regardless of all my cracks. And I think that when we are able to love people when, with all their imperfections, right, to acknowledge that none of us are perfect, that we are going to make mistakes, that we are going to um, show up maybe in, in our you know worst moments from time to time. And when someone says, I love you, I accept you, you are okay, no matter 
what happens, that is, I think, the greatest gift of empathy that someone can give uh, to others. Uh, so I am grateful for, for my husband, Sam, and, um, and I just uh, I'm blessed to have experienced that. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, what I'm hearing a little bit, the framing of it is that um, empathy and unconditional love kind of coexist, right? That's what you're mm -hmm. describing. Like he had so much empathy for what your backstory was and the luggage you were carrying into the marriage, but he still loved you unconditionally despite that, that they're kind of, they're meshed for you in that story. Yeah. It's a lovely story. His name is Sam. Sam, yes. Yeah, well, thank you, Sam. And thank you, Maria, for such a thank wonderful you. conversation. Good luck with your PhD and filling in the research gaps that excite you and inspire you. Um, I want to thank everybody who's been watching and listening. And we'll see you next time at Purposeful Empathy. Thank you so much for watching an episode of Purposeful Empathy. If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe to the channel and also consider picking up your copy of Purposeful Empathy. It's an invitation to dial up empathy in your life. The world needs more empathy. We need more empathy. What are you waiting for?